Welcome to Fire Grill Friday's Teach In interview. Uh, this time it's one on one with the amazing scientist Michael Mann, and I'm 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 really honored, Michael, to to talk with you. For those who don't know who Michael Mann is, um, he is a much awarded, much acclaimed visionary in the sciences. He's a climatologist and a geophysicist, currently director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. And he's, um, you've contributed to a global understanding of the historical climate change based on the temperature regular, how do I say this? The, how, how to describe what your, your specialty is the, the, the temperature record of the past thousand years. Yeah, I, I work in a variety of areas, um, uh, you know, in climate science today, but I'm best known for the so-called hockey stick curve that we published uh, 20 years ago now, which demonstrates the, the unprecedented nature of, of the warming we've seen. Why, why is it called the hockey stick? Yeah, and, and before we get going, let me say that it's, it's uh, truly an honor for me. I'm a big fan of your work, both on screen and off, and, and, and really, um, uh, excited uh, to have this conversation with you. Um, so the hockey stick, it's called the hockey stick curve uh, because it resembles uh, literally a hockey stick in the sense that there is a, a handle, if you like, which is the slow descent as temperatures cooled prior to industrialization uh, from the relatively mi mild conditions that existed a thousand years ago until you get to the Industrial Revolution and then temperatures shoot up. Um, and that's the blade, if you will, of the hockey stick. And so the, the temperature curve looks like a hockey, hockey stick with the blade upturned and, and we are the blade. Um, and the warming that we have seen is unprecedented as far back as we are able to extend um, these sorts of estimates. Uh, but when we published that curve and it became an icon in the climate change debate, uh, I, uh, you know, a, a mild-mannered scientist uh, uh, suddenly found myself at the center of a very fractious debate over human-caused climate change because of the iconic nature of this, uh, this graph that we published. And uh, over the last two decades, I've come to uh, embrace that role, even though it's not the one I signed up for. You know, I, I don't know how you feel. I, I find it problematic to talk about global warming because, you know, the fact is that some years winters are beyond imaginably cold and historically cold in fact and you know so then the deniers say oh, global warming you see we're getting we're getting colder so I, I guess that's why we now say climate emergency or climate crisis rather than than global warming what do you think yeah, you know, I, I think we can't be uh, allow ourselves to be too influenced by the framing uh, of climate change deniers because they're going to distort anything. That's their MO. That's what they've been doing now uh, for a couple decades, and they continue to do. And their numbers are, are tiny. Um, if you look at the public polling, maybe 9% of the public are dismissives on climate change, literally reject the science, but it feels like it's much more pervasive because of the megaphone they have in the form of the right-wing media. Um, but we have to remember that, that most people are actually pretty much on board. But you raise a very interesting point. Now, we call it global warming because if you look at the globe, the globe is steadily warming up over time. Now, any particular region at any particular time could be having a cold snap or a warm snap, and that has to do with the vagaries of uh, the changing uh, weather patterns, uh, the fluctuations in the jet stream uh, on any given day can cause one place to be really warm while the other place is really cold. And there is some interesting science, and, and I've done some of the work in this area as well, that suggests that the jet stream may be slowing down and becoming more wiggly. And as it becomes more wiggly, you get more of those local extremes of, of, both, so, of both signs, both cold and warm extremes. And the, the warming of the planet, and in particular, the uh, exaggerated, uh, the, the um, uh, sort of uh, inflated warming in the Arctic is changing temperature patterns in a way that is causing the jet stream to behave in this funny way. And uh, counterintuitively and ironically, uh, may be allowing for more of these really cold Arctic uh, air outbreaks um, here in the United States. But on the whole, winters are warming up, summers are warming up around the entire planet. Now, we prefer uh, to use, in a scientific context, the term climate change. 
because that describes the collective changes in the system. It isn't just the warming of the planet, it's the melting of the ice. It's the shifting in rainfall patterns, the expansion of drought patterns. Um, all of these things are part of what we call climate change and the warming of the surface is just part of that. So climate change is a more comprehensive term. Climate crisis, I think, is, is a more appropriate term when we're talking about the socio-political uh, uh, dimensions and the impacts of climate change because it is frankly a crisis. We do have to act now. Um, you contributed a chapter called Observed Climate Variability and Change to the 2001 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we've been hearing a lot about the IPCC of late, um, especially from a woman who has inspired me, a girl who's inspired me a lot, Greta Thunberg. Sure. Would you explain to the viewers what is the significance of IPCC? Yeah, and, and Greta, I think she's a, a real hero, um, and I think she's, she's a game changer, uh, mm -hmm. along with you and, and, and other folks who are out there raising awareness now about this issue in an unprecedented manner. I mean, we're really going through a tipping point, I like to say, of the good kind. We don't want to go through the bad tipping points, the climate tipping points, but we do appear to be going through a tipping point when it comes to the public consciousness. And I think a, a big part of that is the youth climate movement and, yeah. and, and folks like uh, Greta, um, uh, as well as um, uh, Alexandria Vilsenor here in the United States um, and around the world, uh, mm -hmm. raising awareness uh, about this, you know, frankly, this crisis. Um, the, um, you know, so, so uh, Greta um, is a great, in fact, I, I forgot what your question was about Greta. Yeah, well, I wanted to know, she puts so much emphasis on this, the newest report yeah. of the IPPC, yeah. IPCC, yeah. and explain to people what the IPCC is. And yeah, sorry to have to make you repeat IPCC so many times. Uh, so uh, it is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a mouthful. Uh, I have trouble saying it myself. Um, and uh, it, this is uh, a body um, of uh, scientists uh, who are authorized under the, the United Na uh, Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the UNFCCC, uh, to produce uh, reports roughly every five years um, that reflect the current scientific understanding uh, of human-caused climate change and the threat that it poses uh, to human civilization and the planet. And by you know its nature, these these scientific bodies tend to be very conservative. Scientists as a whole are, are quite conservative, they're reticent. They don't want to sort of stick their necks out. So uh, usually conservative in how they go about. Uh, framing uh, what we know, very cautious, very reticent. And what's so interesting is that even though the IPCC and this assessment process that they go through is intrinsically a conservative process, it's the reality of, of, of the evidence um, and the unfolding impacts that we now see in real time on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, have led scientists to become increasingly uh, bold um, in, in how they go about uh, stating um, uh, their findings. And the latest IPCC reports are quite stark. Um, uh, if you read them, if you, you know, read the, the, the technical chapters or even just the summary reports, um, you know, the, the scientists are using terms um, like rapid, unprecedented, um, dangerous crisis that they didn't use in the past. And that has to cause you some worry. When scientists are speaking like that, it means we've got a problem on our hands. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's, uh, I am so grateful that scientists are stepping up to this because I think it, I think that's one of the reasons why there has been, or we are now experiencing a tipping point in terms of consciousness and awareness of the urgency of the problem. Um, what really struck me was in that report, scientists saying the only way that we're going to achieve what needs to be achieved is with unprecedented, there's that word again, numbers of people being mobilized from scientists. <laughs> so yeah. unusual. And, and so do you, do you agree with that? 
I, I do. Uh, I think we need a massive mobilization if we're going to achieve the sorts of reductions in carbon emissions that will be necessary to avert catastrophic warming of the planet. We've heard this 12 year number quite a bit over the last year or so. Um, yeah, now, right. And so it's really 11 years and pretty soon it'll be 10 years. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a talking point that has uh, sometimes been misunderstood and, 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 and misrepresented. But the crux of it is that if we are to avert catastrophic warming of the planet, which by any reasonable definition uh, is about a degree and a half Celsius, uh, a little less than three degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet is where we start to see uh, some of the worst and irreversible impacts of climate change. And if we don't bring down our carbon emissions by a factor of two within the next decade, it's very difficult to see a path forward to keeping warming below those levels. And so uh, that is the, the stark nature of the challenge and it requires a mobilization um, unlike anything we've seen before. Uh, sometimes you hear it framed in terms of a World War II like mobilization or an Apollo project. Um, this is actually bigger. This is gonna require an even more concerted effort than anything that we've done before. But the good news is, as you've alluded to, there are a number of factors that are coming together um, if you like, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, perhaps a, a stretched analogy, uh, but a, a perfect storm of, of factors coming together. The youth climate movement, the increasingly um, uh, bold uh, and assertive statements being made by the scientific community, uh, a shift in our politics. Maybe we're starting to see some moderate conservatives come, come on board and recognize it's time to get away from the denial and and, 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 and participate in a worthy conversation about what to do. I think there are a number of things that are coming together that really give me cautious optimism, hope that we, we can tackle this problem in time, but it is going to require, again, an unprecedented effort. And that means individuals, but it means individuals working together, collective action, so that we get the policies, we elect the politicians who are willing to, to make the decisions that will help preserve the planet for us, rather than um, the politicians who, who too often are in the pay of fossil fuel interests and are doing their bidding, rather than uh, the will of the people that they're supposed to be representing. Um, that's where we have uh, one of our greatest opportunities in voting. Um, it's, the, it's perhaps one of the most powerful ways to express our will um, and our voices. It's, it's really the only thing we can do, right? We have to change the policies. We do in their individual behavior. There's a lot of talk about this, sure. We should all do those things in our everyday lives that decrease our environmental footprint. Why wouldn't we? They make us feel better. They save us money. Um, they make us healthier. Um, so we should do all those things and we, we, we should decarbonize our lifestyles as, as much as we can. Um, but that having been said, uh, we also need policies that will incentivize people who might not otherwise be compelled, frankly, to act on what they see as an environmental issue. But if there's, you know, a, 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 what we say, a price signal in the market um, that, that incentivizes a shift away from, you know, a shift towards carbon friendly practices, mm -hmm. then we can get the sort of wholesale buy-in that we're gonna need from everybody to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I work with a lot of environmental organizations and one of the demands of the, fire drill Friday actions that we're doing is no new fossil fuel expansion. If we, we, the stuff that's not already being pumped and fracked has to stay in the ground. Otherwise we'll never meet the, the, um, the carbon budget. Do you agree that, that that is of primary importance? Yeah, I think we need, you know, what, what we say is a supply side as well as demand side right. um, actions, uh, mm -hmm. prevent the additional um, building and funding of infrastructure that just locks us into more and more uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction and burning. We need to stop that and we need to decrease the demand for fossil fuels by incentivizing renewable energy, by helping along this transition that's already uh, underway. I, I don't think there's, there's any question about that. Yeah, of course the fossil fuel industry tries to um, demonize us as consumers. You know, it's not our fault that customers want to use our products and so forth. But um, it's really poppycock because our whole economy, our whole infrastructure is based on fossil fuel. That's yeah. absolutely right. Um, this is what I call, uh, you know, this is the subject actually of, of a book I'm now writing, um, that what I call the new climate war. And it's as the impacts of climate change become so clear to the person on the street that it's very hard for even the most uh, fossil fuel 
uh, driven politician to deny that something's happening. We're seeing a shift towards uh, softer denial, uh, a concession that, oh yeah, maybe you know something's happening here, but hey, the way to solve this problem, for example, isn't uh, policies, it isn't a price on carbon, it isn't uh, systemic change, it isn't regulation, it's just we need people to behave better. <laughs> and, and individual behavior, as we already said, is part of the problem, but we need incentives to get a wholesale shift um, away from fossil fuels. We also hear increasingly, what's remarkable to me, um, there's an effort underway to convince people that it's too late. Some of the, the, the more doomist framing of the climate change problem, where you have you know, certain uh, protagonists who have claimed that there's nothing we can do, we're all going to be extinct in a decade, no matter what. If you truly believe that, and the science doesn't support that at all, but if you truly believe that, it leads you down the same path of inaction yeah. is outright denial of the problem. So we have to be aware of sort of these uh, softer forms of denial, which are being promoted by the very same forces of inaction that were de denying the problem previously. Now they're moving into a different phase of denial, but the end result and, and the, 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 the object is very much the same, to prevent us from ending this addiction that we currently have to fossil fuels. Well, in the United States, it means demanding of the fossil fuel industry that they leave $11 trillion of fossil fuel in the ground, stranded assets. That's, yeah, my that's, that's a big thing to do, right? That's why we need the mobilization of people. Absolutely. And, you know, my good friend Bill McKibben, who's been very outspoken uh, about this, um, wrote this article in, in the Rolling Stones some years ago, which really, I think, created an awareness of, you know, the fact that there's five times as much uh, fossil fuel still in the ground um, uh, on the sort of, you know, uh, on, on, on the bank sheets of the fossil fuel companies, um, assets of theirs um, that we can't afford them to tap into because if they do it will elevate warming well beyond those dangerous levels um, and it's a convincing argument actually to the you know business and finance community that the fossil fuel interests these are bad investments because their major asset uh, has to be stranded it has to be left in the ground yeah so as a scientist what help us understand what the tipping point represents if we don't do if we don't meet our carbon budget within now 11 years, yeah. and at least in this country, it's going to be hard to do it with the current administration, but let's so let's it's 10 years actually. What happens if we don't meet it? Yeah. And I would remind people that there's just, you know, a year now to the, ne to the next presidential election. Um, so things can change quickly. And if people get out and mobilize and vote for politicians, who will represent us rather than the polluting interests, we have a real opportunity to accelerate you know, the change that's already underway. You know, despite having a president who denies climate change, um, we're, we're still seeing some progress here in the United States. We're seeing individual states. Um, California has taken a real leadership role here, uh, but the West Coast states, New England, and many of the mid-Atlantic states banding together to incentivize renewable energy, to, to consider pricing carbon. We're, we're seeing quite a bit of action now, enough so that we may meet our Paris obligations even without the official support of uh, the, the current administration. That's the good news. The bad news is we've got to go well beyond the Paris obligations. That was good three years ago, but now we've got to see even steeper reductions if we're going to avert catastrophic warming. And you asked about some of the tipping points. Um, and so there are the good tipping points, you know, the tipping point in public consciousness that I think we're going through right now. And then there are the bad tipping points. Uh, we warm the climate system enough that we set in motion things that we can't stop. Um, uh, we, we call these, um, you know, tipping points or nonlinearities, um, uh, thresholds. There are various terms to describe them. But basically, it's when we warm the planet enough that we set in motion something that we can't stop. Even if we could magically cool the planet back down, it wouldn't stop because it sort of has a, a mind of its own at that point, if you will. Um, and one of uh, the best examples of that is the melting of the ice sheets. Um, once we destabilize the Antarctic ice sheet, or at least the West Antarctic ice sheet, the part that's uh, most susceptible to collapse, and the Greenland ice sheet, once they get going, 
it's very difficult to, to stop because uh, there is there are these feedback me mechanisms, these vicious cycles that-, that what, are, what does that mean, feedback mechanisms? A feedback mechanism um, is sort of a technical term and there are positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks. What's confusing is a positive feedback is actually a bad thing <laughs> in this case. It means that the change triggers something that further accelerates the change. And I'll give you an example. Um, you melt ice, uh, then the ground can absorb more of the incoming sunlight. So it warms up even faster rather than reflecting the sun back to space. That warming melts even more ice and it feeds on itself. Um, a feedback mechanism. And uh, I sometimes I use a vicious cycle to describe that. And one of the best examples is the melting of ice. And in particular, once you set in motion the collapse of the ice sheets, it's very difficult to stop that. And ultimately, then we're talking not feet, but 20, 30 feet of global sea level rise, uh, threatening all the major coastal cities around the world and low-lying island nations around the world. Um, we don't know exactly when we cross that threshold where we commit to that. That is to say, we've destabilized the ice shelves and they collapse and the ice starts flowing from the ice sheets into the ocean um, in a way that we can't stop. We don't know exactly how much warming triggers that. Um, and there are other examples, there are other tipping points, but I like to use the, ex the, the, the sort of metaphor of a minefield because we don't know where those tipping points are and there are many of them. So to me, it's more like we're walking out onto a minefield and the further we walk out onto that minefield, the greater likelihood we're gonna trigger those, those explosions. Um, that's the real danger there. We wanna stop you know, whatever warming we can because we don't know how close we are to these critical thresholds where we really do lock in devastating uh, changes in the climate system. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're, you're a upper middle class American, in North America, and you're saying, it ain't gonna affect me, even if we don't meet the demands of the climate budget in 10 or 11 years. How is it going to affect you even though you're wealthy and you can live on the top of a hill? Yeah, well, forgive the pun, but no man is an island. Uh, <laughs> and this implies to all, all, all men and, and women and children and everybody on this planet, we're, we're so interconnected. Today's world is so interconnected that a devastating extreme weather event in Asia interrupts supply chains and food distribution, distribution systems around the world. And we've seen that in recent years where uh, unprecedented weather extremes in one part of the world has a ripple effect uh, across the planet because we are so interdependent. And so nobody benefits um, from uh, dangerous climate change. It'll impact all of us, even if you don't live on the coastline uh, and, and, and there's no threat of uh, literal inundation of your home. Um, you're dealing with uh, unprecedented wildfires in the Western US or unprecedented floods just about everywhere. Um, unprecedented heat waves, mm -hmm. um, uh, dangerous heat waves. Uh, that's, you know, there is no escape from climate change. It is right. global in nature. We live in an interconnected world where we've got a seven and a half billion and growing population dependent on the food and water and land that we have and climate change is putting a stress on all of those resources. And it probably means mass migration, tens of millions of people trying to find a place where there's food and water and safety. Absolutely, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, right? Um, less food, less water, less land, growing global population, that's gonna lead to conflict. That's going to lead to wars. Um, it's why our national security community, these are not granola chopping, you know, uh, environmentalists. Uh, some of the most conservative uh, members of our national security community recognize that climate change is the great threat multiplier. Mm -hmm. it, it's the greatest threat that we face in the future from a security standpoint because it heightens all of those tensions. It, it uh, leads to increased uh, demand for more scarce resources and conflict. And ISIS, for example, um, ISIS uh, was uh, born within an environment that was stressed by climate change, an unprecedented drought in Syria that drove rural farmers into the cities like Aleppo, where they were now competing for food and water and space with the people who were already there. Um, that creates 
conflict. Um, that atmosphere provides a perfect recruiting uh, tool for terrorist organizations. And, and that's the context in which ISIS arose. And so when we have a president who says that uh, we, 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 we should ignore climate change because the real problem that we need to deal with is um, you know, international terrorism. Well, there's a deep fallacy there that we can somehow separate these things. We can't, they're intimately connected. Yeah, it's, it seems impossible to imagine that democracy could flourish in the face of worsening climate crisis. Don't you agree? It can't. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it can't, that's pretty stark. What do you think about the Green New Deal? There, there are a lot of things that, that I like about the Green New Deal. I like the way it's changed the conversation. Um, it's gotten, you know, and it's, and, and frankly, it, it's moved the whole sort of window of discourse now in the right direction, where you even see some conservatives now starting to come to the table because they're afraid that they'll get a solution that they don't like. Um, if they don't come to the table and, and actually propose their own solutions. And, and some of the solutions that they're posing aren't real solutions. We have to recognize that um, any meaningful uh, tackling of this problem is going to demand fundamental change. It's going to demand a combination of incentives for renewable energy, uh, policies that get off us, uh, us off fossil fuels, um, uh, policies that incentivize individual behavior as well as um, you know, our collective uh, behavior. Um, the Green New Deal has, you know, hits a lot of the key points there. Um, the, my, the only real criticism I have of the Green New Deal is that in some ways I think it doesn't go far enough um, uh, in that um, I would have liked to see in some of the drafting, you know, some of the descriptions that have been, uh, and it's still sort of an evolving um, thing, but in terms of the, you know, the, the documents, uh, you know, uh, that, you. that I've seen thus mm -hmm. far, um, I'd like to see a little more of a commitment to putting a price on carbon as an additional tool, as a critical additional tool to incentives for renewable energy. Um, there's a lot of uh, language on that side, on incentivizing renewable energy so that we level the playing field. But we'll level the playing field even faster if we provide incentives for renewable energy and we put a price on carbon. And so we're really starting to allow renewable energy, non-carbon, non-planet threatening sources of energy to compete fairly uh, in the market. Um, yeah. the so on carbon though, it you know, it comes down hardest on people who aren't wealthy. It's why there's been so many uh, violent protests around the world and the global south in particular in countries that have. And that's where the, the politics comes in. Absolutely. Because it, it so much depends on what you do with the revenue. Mm -hmm. You can return the revenue to the people in a progressive way. For example, those who are most impacted um, frontline communities benefit uh, more from the revenue that's raised. So there are creative ways that you can try to make sure it's done in a just uh, manner because that is, you know, it is critical that we see a just transition um, and that the people who have historically been most impacted, who have the least resources to deal with the impacts of climate change uh, aren't, um, you know, the ones who are hurt by these policies. And, you know, and so there are legitimate grievances that, you know, have been aired with, uh, with regard to some of the carbon pricing proposals um, that have, you know, been tested, that have been put out there. Um, there's also been uh, some mischief on the part of fossil fuel interests to sort of sow division within the community and get people arguing. And we see a lot of this uh, lately, people arguing about their individual lifestyle choices and their hamburgers <laughs> and their straws as, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, it was Elizabeth Warren, I think, in one of the debates uh, pointed out, you know, fossil fuel interests love to see us arguing with each other about these things because it takes our eye off the ball. Right. And so we do have to think about how, you know, to make sure that this is done in a just way. But there is a role for uh, market mechanisms to try to help, um, you know, accelerate the transition that's already underway you know, the, the stone age didn't end for want of stones, as they say. And the fossil fuel age won't end for want of fossil fuels. It won't end because we run out of fossil fuels. It's ending now because we found something better. That's renewable energy. The, the world is moving that direction. We need to accelerate that transition. You've been dragged into some of these uh, in, internal debates because uh, I think you were, you were quoted as saying, let me see if I have it here, um, 
that uh, behavioral changes and personal responsibility reflects a soft form of climate denial. Yes, so, so that it, the context is very uh, important there. I think you've, there, that you've taken a segment of something that I said. Um, what I've been saying is that there's an attempt by polluting interests to uh, deflect intention entirely away from systemic change exclusively to uh, personal action, to make it all on the individual rather than corporations um, and governments playing their uh, fair share in solving this problem. And one of the things I like to point out when people say, well, Greta, you know, Greta is talking about the things that she does, she won't fly. Um, she is, that's right, and she's saying a great example, but she's also really, much of her effort is holding policymakers accountable, taking them to task for not acting. Um, so you need both, you need systemic change as well as individual change. And where I become concerned is by, you know, mischief makers trying to deflect all the attention away from the need for systemic change by making it sound like it's just individual action. I'll, I'll, one short story here, because I think you, you know, we, uh, we grew up, um, uh, I grew up, um, with, you know, uh, in the early 1970s, I'm sure you remember the, the crying Indian commercial, the, uh, the tearful Native American. Um, yeah. Yes, tell us about that. Yeah. yeah, so that was, and it raised awareness about, you know, the bottle and can litter that was polluting our highways and our countryside, and it raised awareness among individuals uh, of the importance of being responsible and not throwing your litter away, but it turns out it was a remarkably clever marketing campaign by Coca-Cola and the beverage industry to defeat the bottle bills, which were an attempt and a regulatory solution to the accumulating bottle and can litter, um, uh, a, a systemic solution to that problem. They didn't want to have to lose the profits um, that they, you know, that they argued uh, they would lose if they had to process um, this waste. And so instead, they went to Madison Avenue and hatched a PR campaign to deflect all of the attention to individuals and that's what that commercial was about and as a result of that what's one of the other major global environmental problems we deal with today plastic pollution yeah. um, and that's a consequence of a successful effort by industry to deflect attention entirely away from systemic change yeah. to individual uh, behavior and that's what i worry about here um, with the climate problem the, the 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 fossil fuel interest the polluters are doing the same thing um, they're taking advantage of, you know, what is a constructive inclination on our part to be more responsible individuals and to decrease our carbon footprint. But they're trying to frame that as the only solution to the exclusion of the policy changes that they don't want to see enacted. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm so glad that you believe that it's going to take both. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. No, and they feed on each other, right? One, uh, it reinforces the other in both directions. Yeah. I mean, the, the personal changes and decisions, it's, a, it's an on-ramp. Absolutely. But it's not the end. It's just the start. You know, I have a hard time believing that in this day and age, with what the public is beginning to understand about the danger of plastic and what it's doing in particular in our ocean. Yeah that Exxon can get away with saying, our future is in plastic. Do they not realize that we're starting to get what this means? Well, you know, back in the 1970s, there was um, an internal document, uh, Exxon Mobil internal document, where their own scientists, um, working with the same data and models that the rest of the scientific community was working with, um, said that the problem of climate change, if unchecked, these are their words, ExxonMobil's own scientists, would be catastrophic um, and irreversible. Uh, and what did ExxonMobil do? They buried that report. It eventually was unearthed um, by some um, sleuths, uh, you know, some uh, uh, journalists and environmental organizations were uh, eventually recovered those, those, those um, those materials. Um, so they knew, they knew the problem, they knew the problem they were created, and rather than try to help solve it, they doubled down in a massive PR campaign to deny the problem and to actually attack independent scientists um, who were coming to the same conclusion. If it sounds familiar, it's because that playbook was written decades earlier by the tobacco industry. Tobacco. Yeah. yeah. 
and it's been uh, it's been used. I just saw a movie last night with Mark Ruffalo called Dark Waters yeah. about DuPont chemicals and how they knew for decades they were causing people to get cancer because of Teflon. Oh yeah, I, I want to see that film. Oh. Mark, Mark is great. He he does wonderful work um, yeah. in, in this in the environmental arena. Yeah. It is a very powerful, disturbing movie. And it's very parallel to the fossil fuel industry who knew and lied. And how many people have died because of those lies? How many species have been lost because of those lies? Well, you, you know, Jane, you, you know, it's the same story over and over again, um, yeah. whether it was the threat of uh, nuclear uh, meltdowns, um, whether it's the threat of environmental pollution, carbon pollution, uh, uh, pharmaceutical products, whenever the findings of science have found themselves on a collision course with corporate profits, uh, unfortunately, we've seen efforts by vested interests, by those corporations to double down in a campaign of, of, of deceit, to, 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 to literally try to, um, you know, to, 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 to deny the, the damage that their product is doing. Um, in the end, the tobacco industry was ultimately brought to justice. Um, most of these industries ultimately are brought to justice, but decades later than they should have. And, you know, a after we have endured far more suffering, far more loss of life uh, than, we, than we should have. And that was the case with tobacco. Um, it's the, it was the case with lead pollution. It was the case with, um, you know, a concussion, another film, it's the same story, right? Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and unfortunately, um, we're the ones who end up uh, on the, um, you know, uh, suffering the consequences of these disinformation campaigns. These right, corporate. unlike with the tobacco, you know, that affected people who smoked and relatives close to them because of secondhand smoke. What we're, what we're facing now is an existential crisis. Yeah. Everybody, it influences everybody. everybody. And, yeah. and you know, those, the smokers, by and large, were innocent. I mean, one of the things that the tobacco industry hid was the fact that their uh, product was more addictive than cocaine. <laughs> their own internal research demonstrated that as well. They understood that they, that they were addicting people. And so we have to feel some sympathy for, for people who did fall victim to that. But that was a small subset of the population. Um, this impacts every person on the planet. And so I've argued that, you know, the disinformation campaign uh, that was waged by the tobacco industry was, you know, a, um, a crime against humanity. But this is something more. This is a crime against the planet. Yeah. And those, the people responsible sh could be put on trial. Well, we saw that with tobacco, and yeah. I think we will see that with fossil fuels. Um, and, and there are court cases right now, um, yes. anti-racketeering case being brought against uh, fossil fuel companies for hiding this information from their shareholders, right? Which is, it, it turns out, is um, a violation of anti-racketeering laws. It's what the tobacco industry did, and it's what uh, uh, it, it, it is fairly easy to argue that the, the fossil fuel industry has done as well. And I think we're going to see some of these court cases, um, you know, uh, proceeding over the next few years um, and ultimately probably culminating into a similar conclusion that we will see some accountability on the part of these corporate polluters. But, you know, what they're doing, there's, there's, they know what's coming and the two key ways that they're trying to uh, get around it is plastic to just go big into plastic and the other is exporting. Right. And if we, I mean, the fact that the Obama administration lifted the ban on the exporting of crude oil was pretty astonishing. And that's one of the first things that we have to stop and it can be done by executive order. Because right. if we just export it, then we're just transferring it to, to the global south and elsewhere. It's not solving the problem. So as one of the world's, um, leading visionary scientists, send out your message for what you want to see people do. So don't be fooled. Um, we really have a chance to be victorious in, in this battle to preserve our planet for 
future generations, for our children and grandchildren. It isn't too late. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. There are those who would like you to think it's too late because it will lead you down a path of hopelessness and, and despair and inaction. Um, it plays right into the agenda of uh, our, our continued uh, addiction to fossil fuels. Uh, corporate polluters would love to see you disengaged on this issue. They would also like love to see you fighting with each other. So let's be aware, you know, some of these arguments about personal behavior um, um, are intended to divide and conquer. It's a way of dividing and conquering the client uh, the climate movement. So don't allow them to be sex, uh, successful in deploying these wedges to divide us when it comes to, for example, lifestyle or what generation we belong to or you know, uh, issues of, of gender uh, and ethnicity. Um, don't allow them to divide us. That's what they want to see this to generate into an argument between climate advocates because as long as we're arguing with each other, we're not taking the time and effort to hold the true uh, you know, uh, villains in this problem accountable to, to, to focus our attention on corporate polluters and to make sure they're held accountable and that we get the policies necessary to, in essence, um, end uh, their reign um, when it comes to uh, uh, the global energy um, uh, uh, economy um, and 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 bring in you know this and allow for the flourishing of uh, renewable energy that's the great revolution of this century and and we have to make sure that fossil fuel interests are not allowed to block it thank you Michael it's been thank a you for talking to you appreciate it let's been my pleasure move forward together science and people thank you absolutely thank you thank you for all you're doing and I look forward to, to staying in touch Thanks.